woes. You know, there are three woe trumps. And if, if what you believe is true, there shouldn't be a second to it, always. And um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to find out. And you want to remember also, always, what goes around comes around. One of the first lectures God ever gave you in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, which tells you how to be happy in these bodies. What goes around is going to happen again. That's the way God teaches. So if you would, we're going to open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. right into it there. What, what I want you to be in mind of is many things have types, but then don't forget about them once you see one type come along. It's going to happen again. So with that being said, let's go to chapter 8 and pick it up with about verse 8. We've got the trumps coming loose here. And the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and a third part of the sea became blood. Now that really sounds, you know, we know that happened in Egypt once. But there's other ways than things being turned to red. So if you were to turn to uh, Revelation chapter 17 verse 15, we're not going there. But it would tell you that the water are the peoples, the multitudes, and the tongues. They're turned red. Therefore, look around you. A third turn to red. That's socialism. That's communism. That's the little old maypole, the red flags, and we're all one, and, and everything's happy. So they're turned to red, they love it, the government's going to feed them, the government's going to take care of them, and we're just all one. There's just one problem, that doesn't work. It never has worked. But you see what I mean? You want to really keep your eyes open. There are things happening right now that if you're not careful, you'll overlook them because that prophecy has come to pass. And if, if um, if you're not aware of it, then you're asleep, definitely. Because people love uh, to take advantage of other people as long as they can blame it on the government. It's free. Everything is free. Okay, so there we go. And verse 9 then. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. In other words, prosperity goes down the drain. Uh, trade, business, uh, capitalism, it suffers. And the people that had life, that means a soul, uh, a third of them, they sink. Because why? Uh, many of you didn't live back at the time when uh, Russia first came out and was trying to destroy the name of God and it was beginning to be removed from our vocabulary, from our schools, in many places that, and they're still trying. But thank God we can find out that in Syria there's a group of Christians that it was either be beheaded or change religion. I mean, most of them said, well, I can't tell you what they said. But they kept their Christianity. And that's, that is the way you can tell the difference in, between a true Christian and one that would like to be. In the prior verse, you notice it said a mountain would be cast into the sea. Do you know what a mountain is, spiritually speaking, symbolically? It's a nation. So there's one nation going to be cast into the sea out of this deal. And it, uh, you may have begun to see the beginning of it even now when they cry, peace, peace, I guarantee you there will be no peace. 
Verse 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, that's the waters, the people, and upon the fountains of waters. Well, what was that? Now, Satan isn't cast out until the, the sixth trump. This is the fourth. So what does it mean? Christ would tell you, I would be helped Satan fall from heaven as a star. But you see, he's here spiritually. And that's what this has reference to. Probably 9-11 gives you a good example of when the demons were turned loose. And, and um, things unheard of begin to happen. Innocent people, being their lives being taken. And, and uh, certain countries being proud of it, thinking they're serving God to destroy babies, thinking they're serving God to destroy innocent people. You serve a different God than I do if that's what you think, because God is a protector of his people. And that's what this writing is about, protecting us from ignorance, whereby we know and understand what tomorrow brings, and if whether what you believe is correct or false. That's what you need to know. We're going to find a second witness to those things today. Verse 11, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters. This is a spiritual death, okay, because they were made bitter. And boy, are they bitter. You know, um, it, it is almost a shame. I've always been so proud of this nation and serving it, and still am. But when I see people on the street, where the, if you were to walk up to one and have them explain their beliefs and faith, they don't, they, they, they're lost. They have no idea. The, our history, the fantastic, wonderful history of this nation chosen by God, in God we trust, that they don't know the history anymore. They, few of them don't even know who Abraham Lincoln was, much less George Washington. And, and you know, uh, everybody should know those. They should know a, a little history. That's where pride comes from in a nation is the history of it and the will of the people. And when they take God and history both away from you, you've got like lo loose guns on the deck all over the place. Not literally guns, but I mean people that have no idea, no conception of what they stand for or what our nation stands for. Verse 12, and the fourth angel sounded and a third part of the sun was smitten and a third part of the moon and a third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And it, it is true that many people live in darkness even today. Darkness under that shadow of that cloud, that, that maypole, that color red, as it takes over nation after nation, country after country, when it has the opportunity, and it does it under many names, and so it is. Um, and verse 13, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now this is why we came here. There are three woe trumps. We need documentation to what they stand for. We need to know if what we believe concerning the con the the um, conclusion of this particular dispensation of time is correct. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet and the three angels which are yet to sound. That's the fifth, sixth, and the seventh. Now the fifth trumpet, and it sounded, it's a time for teaching. That's what the fifth trump is all about. Is you know, Revelation chapter 7 will document that. Stop the end until the seal of God is placed in the minds of my children, the people. And so naturally, that's why the fifth is that time of teaching. 
And the end is not going to come until those seals are established. We're getting pretty close. And, and how it is that we're blessed to be a part of that, to be a part of our Father's family, that he loves us, that he takes care of us, he looks out for us, it's far better than the government looking out for you. God is forever. Governments fail, unfortunately. They truly do. Now, what we want to do, there, the fifth is teaching. The sixth is the appearance of the evil one, which we saw in the fourth even. He appears in the sixth. And woe to those that do not recognize him. And naturally in the seventh, then after the fact, naturally, many will be so disheartened because you know what Christ is going to say to them? I mean, this is people that think they have served God. Depart from me, I know you not. He will say it. So let's go into the word then and find us a second witness that what we believe is true, accurate, and correct by the three woes. Now you're going to have in the word of God many times, woe is me. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about woes that become final. Woes that send you to hell. And the, at the same time, I want you to always remember in your mind that these negative things of the woes, they don't apply to you. Why? Because you're serving God. You're not being misled, led astray, or whatever it takes in fulfilling those woes. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13 gives us two woes in one chapter. And that, those woes are the fifth, the, and the sixth, I'm sorry, they, they are, yes, that's correct. So let's start with it, Ezekiel 13, and the word of the Lord came unto me saying, now that's what makes it important. Is it man's word or is it the Lord's word? That's why you always wanna teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse, because that's what the Lord says. You're not gonna to go too far wrong that way. But when you get some person trying to make a name for themselves and claiming this and claiming big things there and never documents it or brings, can document it from God's word, you got a fake. And it doesn't take a very, you know, you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the socket to know that. If, if a man's truth, uh, it should come from God's word or you really don't want to listen to it. Okay, verse 2, son of man prophesy against, I, I emphasize against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. In other words, you better listen. I don't care what kind of preacher you are. Verse 3, thus saith the Lord God, whoa, now here's your fifth. It has to do with teaching and teachers. Prophet is a teacher. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. And unfortunately, it always ends up as nothing. And how many hearts can be broken by false teaching rather than staying in the true word of God? It's so easy, so simple to stay chapter by chapter and verse by verse knowing it is your heavenly father directing you and he's the judge. Now, the final judge is who you want to obey. And the final judge is our heavenly father and his loving hand. You can commit your soul and never worry about it. He'll take good care of it. But this goes for people that teach and do not double check their word that teach falsely when it's so simple to dig to the truth. Verse four, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. This is a, a play from the Song of Solomon. 
the greatest love story ever told where the little Kenites bump the young grapevines when they're just in flower and knock the little flowers off where you've got no grapes. It, it always bombs because it doesn't produce fruit and neither does anything they touch usually unless they so desire. Fine. You have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge of the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, of course, is the millennium, but the seventh trump is coming. That begins the day of the Lord, and many, they're not going to make it. And he's going to say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. That word never is a long time. Well, you might say, well, they claimed he did. Yeah, that's all it was, was a claim. If you're teaching falsely, and this has to do with teachers, you know, it's an awesome responsibility to begin to teach God's word if you truly know what a false teacher can, will derive from it. I mean, if you want to make God angry, then just try that shoe on for a while. It is not, would not be comfortable. Verse 6, they have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, the Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. What word? The word of God. That's why that as long as you stick with the true word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, then uh, certainly that particular woe, you are immune from it or to it. It can't bother you. Why? Because you love the Lord. You love his word. And you care what God says rather than man. Any man. This man or any other man. You've got to check them out in the word of God. Um, verse 7. Have you not seen a vain vi uh, vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination? Whereas you say the Lord said it. Albeit I have not spoken. I didn't say it. Now that, that puts you in a bad spot. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. That is a very strong statement. If you've got God against you, you're, you're almost in a hopeless case unless there's a great repentance begin, revival in your little heart. Or maybe you got a big one, I don't know. But it's going to take a lot of repenting there if God is against you to get back into the Word and find out what does saith the Lord. Well, this is what he's saying. Be careful what you hear. You can always document it in God's Word. Okay, It's there for you. And mine hands, verse 9, and mine hands shall be upon the prophets that see vanities and that divine lies, they shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. That's pretty tough. I mean, again, that's, that's why it is a very serious matter to teach people, God's people, you had better be teaching God's word when you do because that's pretty final. You, you want to know a woe? That is a woe. But who does it apply to? False teachers. Woe to them if they participate in this sort of doing. And let me add, those that are taken in by it, even though it may be by ignorance, they're in bad shape. They're listening to lies. They're not serving God, and he's not pleased. Verse 10, because, you, because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. That means they build up in your mind a wall of protection. Though the wall may not even exist, it's in your mind that that wall is there and they're going to take care of me. Well, I would hate to, I would hate to put my hope in man rather than God. 
uh, you would be pretty easily had if that were the case. You put your hope in Almighty God, His Word. You know, He wrote this whole letter to you, instructing you, the, uh, guiding you where you could not go wrong. And, you know, this is so simple a child can understand it. You don't listen to false teachers. You listen to the Word of God. And you listen chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Say unto them which dub, dub with untempered mortar that it shall fall, there shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstone, and, and yea, O great hailstones shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. He's promising you, he's going to take that wall of lies down. Now, untempered mortar is whitewash. What happens when you whitewash a wall outside and a heavy rain comes? You got a lot of runoff, all right. <laughs> you know, where did it go? Well, it didn't amount to anything. It's gone. Well, that's what false teaching will do for you as well. It's untempered. To temper teaching, it must be tempered with the Word of God and nothing else. The Word of God will always give you a second witness. This woe is a very severe woe. To those that teach falsely, there is not all that much hope for them. Uh, the millennium knows and God is judge. I'm not and you're not. But you read it yourself there. That's pretty severe. They are not going to be written in the book. That's pretty final. Verse 12, Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith you have daubed it? Where is this security you promised me? They're not going to answer. Why? They'll be running faster than you are. Okay. 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. Uh, that's pretty final, Warren. It really is. So, Stick to his word. Well, how do I do that? Read it. Study it. If somebody comes, I want to tell you a new thing I've discovered. Well, what is it and where did you get it from God's word? Well, I didn't get it from God's word. And then, well, I may listen to you as a friend to advise you that you're asking for trouble because the penalty, this woe, is an awesome, severe woe to those that would call themselves preacher and not preach the word of God. It's, they, they are in, if you wanted to pray for somebody that probably needed help, that'd be a good place to start. 14, so when I break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof. Now, see how final that is? Consumed um, in the midst thereof, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I've got the final say, I'm the judge. So that's why you want to always listen to him. Again, teaching is an awesome responsibility, but it's so pleasing and so wonderful to teach the word of God, chapter by chapter, and line by line, what saith the Lord? You can't go wrong with that. Uh, let people say what they might. Stick with the Father. He's the judge. And there's a lot of people that, you know, this should remind you in Revelation chapter 9 where it stipulates many pray for the mountains to fall on them when Christ returns. They're ashamed. They, they were Christians, supposedly. Like the ten virgins, they're the five that didn't make it. Uh, they, they claim to be Christians, but they listened to men. It was so exciting. He was so, I mean, he could really get to you. He could touch you. Well, what did he teach you? I don't know. It just felt good. Uh, that, that doesn't cut it. Okay. You want to stay in the Word of God. You know, many, I've had 
pastors that you would know if I dropped their name that are famous throughout the country that have said, you cannot teach scripture chapter by chapter and verse too boring to people. It's only boring if the preacher thereof makes it boring. God's word is young, it is vivacious, it is continuing. It is our life. Uh, verse 15, thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, the wall is no more martyr, uh, neither they that have daubed it. Again, that's pretty severe. That is almost final, but then I'm not judging. The millennium changes a lot of things. Verse 16, to wit the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and, when, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord. This is something you want to watch very closely today. And so you've got a lot going on in that area. And um, it's surrounded, as Luke 21 said it would be. So be alert. Now, that's that particular woe. It's the false teaching. Because the fifth trump is about teaching. But teaching God's word. Verse 17. Likewise, thou son of man... Set thy face against the daughters of thy people which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them that like to have their own church, okay? Well, it's my name. Now, why, how, how about putting Christ's name, the shepherd of all shepherds? You know, you don't mean man's name. And say, thus saith the Lord God, woe, here's your next woe documenting it right before your very eyes. Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every statute to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come unto you? That's a woe trump. False teaching. Flyaway doctrine. Do you, do you know the proper translation for sew pillows to all armholes? It's to sew coverings over my outreach saving arms. Every knuckle, every joint of my outreach arm, you cover over to the people. Again, okay, false teaching. But here you see what they're teaching. And that... that um, is not all that difficult to understand. And do you know that the new Bible translations are trying to change this? Well, they have, okay. The NIV, read this same verse. You won't find anything there. You'll talk about birds twittering, you know, and, and uh, that's a big help, isn't it? He'll twitter their bird all right. You can rest assured. Okay, would you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that uh, come unto you? They can't save anything. There's only one Savior. There's only one door. And the sheep know that door. Go through it. Don't try to make any shortcuts. Walk under that, uh, um, uh, the shepherd's rod as he counts the keeper of that door. 19, and will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. You know, uh, when you hear the, uh, in a group, they do it for handfuls of barley half of the time is spent raising money. And I can tell you, if you teach God's word, if you teach it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and teach what God says, you won't have to beg for money. People are drawn to the truth. They seek it out. They're starving, literally starving for truth out there. And where does it come from? Not from begging. Okay. Do you know, uh, I'm, I don't know if I want to go here or not. I guess I will. 
um, my, my better judgment is saying, whoa, and, <laughs> but I, I guess I'll give you an example. And I get in trouble for doing this. You understand, so pray for me. And the board may be very unhappy. But do you know how much it cost us to do one hour of television live? Over $100,000, OK? Because we have such a huge network all around the world, basically. And do you know something? You'll never hear us beg. You'll never hear us put on a telethon. And you might say, well, why? Well, we don't need to. And neither do they if they will teach God's word rather than trying to make a handful of barley and beggarly. The, one of the first um, orders that Jesus Christ gave those that would go out and teach don't take a begging bag with you. He is very much against it. What, what will I do then? Well, are you a Christian? Well, yes. Do you believe in God? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Do you believe he'll take care of you? Uh, well, well, you don't believe that, okay? You have to know he's gonna work it out. As long as you're doing his bidding, God will work it out, you know. So um, little people, the reason I shared that with you and let, took advantage of my better judgment is that little people can make a big difference and you do. Okay, God bless you. Uh, verse 20, wherefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against your pillows. If God's against something, you do not want to go there. We're with you there, hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. There's your second woe and a witness to it. You want to be careful of anyone that teaches that. That's with the second woe. That's severe. Your kerchiefs also will I tear. These things you put over my hands, I'm going to rip them and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be haunted, hunted, and you shall know that I am the Lord. That's a very warming thing. He said, I'm going to take care of my people that stick with me. And as long as you stick with him, in studying chapter by chapter and verse by verse, I'm repeating that, but it's God's word. That is so surpasses man's word that you want to listen to your father, for he's your judge. And he's letting you know how he feels about some things. And he's not kidding around. He means business. <clears throat> Verse 22, because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad. And it, it does make you sad when you see our people lied to the way they are, misled the way they are. <clears throat> Excuse me whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that uh, he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life, by promising salvation when you're not saved yourself. Why? Because you're not teaching God's word. God is the only savior through the Son. There is no other. Verse 23, therefore you shall see no more vanity, nor divine, uh, nor divine divination, dev, divinations, for I will devour, uh, deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I'm gonna have to get my glasses changed. <laughs> these, somebody's trying to change these words right in front of my eyes. I, I jest, they're not, but um, this, um, uh, a little, it's, it is past time that I had it done. Anyway, right, Martha? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's two woes in one chapter. Now we have two chapters with the same woe, the seventh. Guess what it is? And this is not, like I said, I don't want you to run away with this. This is not woe is me. 
This is God saying, woe to those that do this uh, thing. And that means he's had it with it. But the two chapters you find it in is Matthew 24 and Mark 13, when you find that seventh woe. Now listen to me. What did, what, did the prof, what did the disciples say to Jesus when they left Jerusalem in Matthew 24? Tell us what will be the end and what will be happening at that time so that we can know and understand the consummation of the end of this age. My paraphrasing. Uh, and, and he told them seven things, which are the seven trumps. And one of those seven that he explained in both of those places, and we're going to go to, let's go to Mark 13. Mark is 13 is the shortest, one of the shortest gospels. It'll be easier for you to find. No, no, I'm being, <laughs> never mind. <clears throat> okay. I'm picking at you a little bit and seeing if you're awake, all right? <clears throat> the last woe. These are the things that would happen that consummate the end of this age. Mark 13. Let's pick it up with verse 16. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up a garment. In other words, you're not going to have time. Verse 17. But woe. Here it is. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. This is not talking about a physical child in a womb. That's a blessing. That's a precious thing. That's a gift from God. He's talking about spiritually those that become impregnated in their minds with lies and, de and lying divinations, false teachings. Now, there is a tense in this, and this is in the past tense. It's already happened. She's pregnant, and not only is she pregnant, she's nursing along. What does it mean? It means she's been deceived by Satan when he's cast out, as Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 declares, <clears throat> and has wed him, thinking she was wedding the true Christ, and she is spiritually, and spiritually only, with a child. She nurses Satan's, she's not only converted to Satan's church, she's um, assisting it, nursing it, making it stronger, taking a big part in Satan's folly. You talk about a woe. That's the woe, and it is after the fact, like I said. It would happen in the sixth trump, but now the woe, she's got to answer for it in the seventh when Christ returns. There she thought she was doing so well, and he's going to have to say, depart from me, I know you not. She could have read the scripture. She could have known the false Christ comes first. The child can count between six and seven. It's that simple. So we've covered the three woe trumps and what kind of teaching will put you in trouble and what kind of teaching will pull you out of it. A second witness to the book of Revelation. And do you know something? When I think about it, that's what we teach. Okay? That's what we believe. So we've got nothing to worry about. Though many may make light of what we teach, God doesn't. I'd lot rather be pleasing to God and be blessed because we are indeed blessed, beloved, so blessed that, um, and then to have the way of man, okay. I suppose I want to conclude in, tw in Revelation 12, 12. that kind of consummates this. There is always a second witness in God's word, even to the woe trump. And um, there you have it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you're all familiar with this, excuse me, this 12th chapter. It has to do with Satan being cast from heaven. Michael and his angels do it 
in verse 6 and 7. We're going to go to 12. I want to say it because it's easy to remember. 12, 12. Okay. And 12, 12 reads, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. That is to say, why should heaven begin to rejoice all of a sudden? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. That's the people. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he have but a short time. And, and he went after the woman, which is Mother Israel, it's you. He's going to do it. Okay? He's going to try you. He does every day. Well, you might say, well, why does he try us so much? Because he's got the rest of them. He wants you. So he's going to make things a little tough for you, but you sold your own. You get tough. I mean, you get right down junkyard dog tough when it comes to Satan, but gentle and loving when it comes to God's children. Okay. And, and there you have it. Witness to the three woes that what we taught, have taught from the beginning by staying with the word of God. You see, that's what separated. There's no big mystery. Because God made the promise to anybody that will take the word and teach it as it is. He's going to bless you. You can count on it. If you're, if you're honest and, and um, uh, not being deceitful, but really want to help people. If you pray for something, if it comes to helping the people, God's going to hear that. Because he loves people that help people. Always remember that. You'll get your prayers answered right real quick. And um, to, if it has to do with you helping people. So God's word is so complete. It's so wonderful. That um, we don't have to worry about the woes. We're immune to that. We've been inoculated with truth. And that truth is settled right in. We would not take anything for it because it's our key to entering those gates to our Father, that love, that understanding, that eternity. And do you understand you're going to have to put up with each other forever? Mm -mm -mm. Well, maybe it won't be so bad if you're all a bunch of angels, all right? But then they say even angels can be up in the air harping about something. So. <laughs> so just stick with his word and you'll do fine. There's, we're, in, we're in troubling times and, and people are going to try to shake you up and you're not going to let it happen. You're going to stand, you're going to soldier your own and you're going to stand firm. Why? Because you're a child of the living God. And you know what? He loves you. God bless you. Have a good day. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Uh, well, because, why? Because it would not be, it would be perverted if he had an affair with the fallen angel. But um, perverted it is anyway. But you have Christ over your head, and you're going to tell that fallen angel where to put his, his uh, place, and it'll be in hell. 
and you'll stand up against him and never have to worry about it. God will give you the strength. He will protect you within that. So again, I want to emphasize, your answer is in the 10th verse. The reason you had to have your head covered was because of the angels. Okay, They're coming back again. Satan and his angels are going to be cast out of heaven. Heaven. You can read that in Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Rebecca from North Carolina. As Deborah is raised up in the Bible and God is appointed, pointing her to lead uh, the Israel, Israel army instead of a man, is there any documentation as to how and when you know that God is uplifting you and has given you an appointment? And what point would you know that it is not a male appointment, but a female appointment? Well, Rebecca, you're a female. If he gives it to you, it's a female appointment. Okay. You, you got to make a, make a note of Acts chapter 2 and cover it real well. And you'll see that when, when Peter said these are this is that that Joel spoke of Joel the prophet that both my sons and my daughters shall prophesy and lead and then go to Joel chapter 2 and find out what they really said and uh, it wasn't unknown and and certainly God does use both male and female always he always has and I know that uh, I know that a lot of men uh, will try to put women down, be that as it may. You'll never hear me do that, because God is not a he's he he is not a respecter of persons uh, in that sense. If he's going to use somebody, he's going to use them. So, uh, what about Nathan and his four virgin daughters that were? prophetist and and do you know what what the go back to the question uh, just prior to yours where it was first Corinthians chapter 11 what does it say there that this woman before she prophesies she should cover her head what does prophesy mean to teach before she teaches have Christ over her head um, where in the Bible does it say Abraham had two wives. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 1, Sarah had passed away. And so, and so he took a second wife. Her name was Keturah. Okay, and you'll, you can read that in Genesis 25, 1. Keturah was the mother of Medan, whereby... Moses married into a family of Midianites, which means offspring of Abraham, that lived in the land of the Kenites. They were not Kenites. They simply were called that by geographical location, such as you live in California and you're a Californian. Um, not by birth or anything, but by location. And so it was with them that... Uh, that uh, it was so. But that's how you trigger and find who it was really that Moses married. It certainly was not a Kenite. It was a family of Mennonites, which, which Mennonites, which lived. He was, why, Jethro was a priest, so he had to be pure blood to be a priest, a son of Abraham, okay? Georgia from California. When Jesus went out into the desert, is that if that was really Satan talking to him, or was it his spirit? God bless you and thank you for being on television. I'm learning a lot. Well, good. We enjoy being here. Uh, he was in person, de facto. It was it was a one and all time teaching for us that. Satan used what to try to persuade Christ? This is important. Scripture. 
Satan quotes scripture, I mean right and left. There's just one problem. And most Christians are not even equipped enough to know. He twists them. He'll quote that scripture, but he'll twist it right at the end about 90 degrees where it becomes a lie. And this is why the lesson is so important. In uh, Matthew, uh, where he was uh, tested in the wilderness for 40 days, to note what scripture he used, Satan. He's a scripture lawyer. And you, you want to be prepared for that. Christ put him down on each of them, but he was there in person, just like he will be here in person when he comes as the false messiah. Uh, Carla from California, I want to know where in the Bible can I find honor thy mother, respect thy mother, listen to mother. I have two sons who are not accepting this. Well, you, you need to tell them to read Exodus chapter 20. That's the Ten Commandments. And the first commandment that guarantees long life is to honor your mother and father. You, you receive a long life for that. And so, uh, be that as it may, I hope that helps you. Uh, Maria from Arizona, could you explain why Jesus cursed the fig tree Seeing that it is not yet the season for figs, may the good Lord continue to bless you and the staff. Well, he sure does. Well, because there's good figs and bad figs, as when, when you're learning the parable of the fig tree, and you go to the great book of Jeremiah, you find there are some figs that are so good, and there's others that are just not fit to eat. That's what, why Christ cursed them. He knew it was not time, but he did it to document that the, the fig tree generation is whereby it would be the final generation. And all prophecies, and I'm quoting from Mark 13, all prophecies would come to pass in that particular uh, uh, time, that is to say the generation of the fig tree. And, and so it is. That generation started in the year of our Lord, 1948. Uh, Keith, and I don't know where Keith's from, what does amen mean? Amen means that's that. That's why when you finish giving, delivering a message and you say amen, you say that's that. In other words, you don't argue with God's word you accept it, period. End of story, that's what it means. And not, not in a derogatory sense, but as a fact. That's the way it is, it's not gonna be any different. Jan from Tennessee. Where in the Bible, where, where is it in the Bible where if you do premeditate murder, it says, they are to be killed and sent to the Father. Uh, there, there's more than one place. Deuteronomy chapter 19 basically is a good starting place. But, but first, you have, to, you have to be very careful when you're dealing with God's law. You have to understand the difference between a crime of passion, which is a form of insanity, Jealousy, rage can cause one to actually be, uh, in a sense, insane for a moment. That's a, a crime of passion. That's not to lie in wait just because you hate someone and kill them. That's, that's what we're talking about here, it is uh, someone that uh, just destroys a life for the sake of destroying it. Um, then. Then God says, when you got two witnesses identifying that's them, then you don't give them a trial on earth. You execute them. As a matter of fact, let's say like if it was a 12-year-old girl and some guy molested and murdered her, the father gets to cast the first stone, the father of the daughter. 
But he said, I don't want you to take or feel bad about any of this because it isn't you that do it, but I have ordered it. It is I that do it. And the reason being, others will see, this is to be done publicly, others will see and these things will cease happening among you. So God does teach capital punishment. Another place for a double witness is, is Numbers chapter 35 will give you the same message. If, if they premeditate, send them to me. I'll do the judging. And ultimately, he, he shall anyway. That's the way it shall be. Okay, and Dan from Iowa. I did not understand where you said that the tribulation would last five months. Please explain. I'm used to the tribulation being three and a half or seven years before the rapture takes place. Is, is where the Lord comes back and takes his children out. Well, he doesn't do that until the seventh trump, and you've still got the sixth trump to make it through, but you'll find it in Revelation chapter 9, and I am out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. It's the letter that he has sent to you telling you how to be in control of your life, and have the blessings of God and the happiness of it as you are. You make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me. Listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.